you know, maybe you don't know what you don't know. And taking that attitude of just being a fantastic learner is at the core of seeking whatever your next challenge is. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Jake Rudin and Erin Pellegrino, founders of Out of Architecture, who are a career consulting firm who are interested in exploring the value of architectural skills, both in and outside of the architecture profession. So both Jake and Erin are incredibly interesting people, and I thoroughly love having them on the show. Jake has a decade of experience Experience in building things from the ground up. He currently works at Adidas, where he leads teams in computational design, digital technologies, and pattern engineering. Previously, Jake was the director of business development at an ed tech startup. He worked around the world as a designer for top architecture and design firms and has taught extensively in the architecture and design fields. Erin is a designer and a registered architect with a decade of experience in the field. She's worked in business development, creative consulting, and she's currently working as the founder and principal of Matter, a design firm that solves problems that span from brand and digital experiences to the built environment. She's worked extensively in the venture and startup space in the Northeast with early stage companies, as well as VC funds on design, visual narrative strategy, and brand development. Erin has also taught and and coached in architecture and design fields at universities, including Harvard, Cornell, Parsons, the City University of New York, and the New Jersey Institute of Technology. So pretty interesting guests this week. Um, it's not the first podcast I've done with uh, Jake and Erin. And in this episode, they do not disappoint. And we discuss the disconnect between architectural education and the profession. We look at how our skills and training can actually be invaluable to many different roles in different industries and how you can create and design an architecture career that fits you. We look at their new book, Out of Architecture, and why many firms are losing out on talent and talent retention due to hiring processes. We discuss the challenges that university education faces with the education of an architect and this disconnect between the profession. And we also look at the taboo or concerns that many young architects are facing simply because they're part of a network that is exploring possibilities outside of the traditional profession so all the information of how you can get in touch with erin and jake are in the info of this podcast so sit back relax and enjoy jake rudin and erin pellegrino this podcast is produced by business of architecture a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals this episode is sponsored by smart practice business of architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom fulfillment and financial profit if you want access for our free training on how to do this please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you please follow the link in the information. Jake, Erin, what a pleasure to have you guys back on the business of architecture. How are you guys? Hi, Ryan. We are so good. We have just been looking forward to this all day. And uh, for the last you know, 20 minutes before we hit record, I'm glad that we you know, we slagged off everyone we needed to, <laughs> you know, we got, we got all the dirty <laughs> jokes out. We had all the, all the humor. So this is going to be a totally clean, totally untoward podcast, you know, with the complete sanitized. agreeability, as you put it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The sanitized commentary <laughs> on the architectural industry here. <laughs> no, we're doing really well. Um, we're really happy to be back. A lot of really exciting things have happened on, on our side and also great to hear that a lot of things have happened on your side. So it's it's great to be back in the digital world with you and, and having another chat. Love it. So the last conversation we had a few months back was, I thought I really, really enjoyed speaking with you guys. And I love the, the whole premise of Out of Architecture and, you know, as, as an agency, it's kind of part therapeutic, part um, business, part recruitment. Um, and is and is actually kind of tapping into this latent power of architects and I think you know actually people who are making an enormous investment into their careers or into their education of actually being empowered to have a lot more choice over where they direct their skills talents 
and you know you're actually maximizing or enabling a better return on investment from these very long architecture courses that the that we see all around the world um and interestingly you know erin you, you were saying that uh one of the things that came out from this conversation or that's come out from out of architecture has actually been that sometimes younger students are a little bit cautious about talking about their desires to want to do something else. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, and I think what was interesting for, for myself and, I, and Jake as well in the conversations that we have is just how much that hit home. Mm. You know, not to completely age us, but we're, you know, about 10 years out of our, our undergraduate um, or just coming up on that. And for us or for me, I think that's a familiar feeling, this idea that I'm I can't go against the the traditions and what I've been sort of raised in architecture to to do and be excited about. And if other things excite me, something's wrong with me. Right. There's a sort of sense of the other. Um, and I think I would have hoped that that would have changed. I think in many instances it has changed, but perhaps not pervasively enough. And what we've found is that people are reaching out to us on private channels to say that, you know, they really appreciate our content, um, but they can't follow us. They're afraid who's going to see that they're following us. They're afraid if they make a LinkedIn connection, their boss may find out or their, you know, coworkers, or, or even in some cases, we've had conversations with younger, um, or let's say early graduates who are willing or wanting and willing to work with us, but have even asked us, how can I talk to my friends about this to keep them as my friends, even though I think they could also use this service. So mm. I think that's a, uh, that's, it's perplexing to me and in, in, in a sense of knowing how we can do something about it, but also it just makes me want to give the entire profession a, a giant hug and tell everyone that okay. everything's okay. <laughs> very, that's, that's, that's very, very interesting. Jake, what are your, your thoughts or your, what's been some of your experiences with this as well? Well, last time we spoke, we alluded to um, this uh, this project that we had been been undertaking, and you know, I'll I'll point, but for the listeners, I'm I'm pointing to a, a very uh, small copy of the upcoming Out of Architecture book that is way back sitting in my background. And I, I think what's interesting about what Aaron's saying is, in this book, we have, we documented a huge amount of these confrontations that we've found over over the years. And uh, I think that it's an interesting place to both, uh, you know, be out of kind of the realm of traditional practice in some ways, um, to have explored other pathways to have, you know, taken on um, whatever other side projects or industries or, or challenges that we wanted to face, but then also to have this, you know, insane love and to try to uh, you know, point back to the profession and celebrate it while mm -hmm. at the same time being critical of it. Um, and I think, you know, someone recently um, pointed at me and said, well, that's a double edged sword. And I, I said, yes, you know, it, it absolutely is. Um, it's a very challenging line for us to walk. Um, but the narrative of out of architecture, which is, you know, at its core, a career consulting firm, um, being the villain has shifted heavily to this notion that we are kind of, you know, supporter with a different perspective than those who are still in or have always been inside of traditional practice. Very recently, we were approached um, by a group of, uh, you know, highly respected, um, you know, later career professionals who have sort of formed this professional community. And the questions that they were asking us were absolutely not oh, why are you stealing, you know, architects from us and the best people and all these things. They came to us to understand how can we retain some of this talent? Mm. How can we explore using these skills in better ways inside of our traditional architecture practices? You know, how might, how might we be able to even pull talent from other disciplines into our architecture firms? And these are firms that would have absolutely recognizable names within traditional, you know, commercial architecture. So, that was a really wonderful experience where this narrative was kind of flipped for us. And I wish we could tell the younger, you know, um, out of architecture community, 
that in fact, you know, if they were more open about communicating what they needed, I think they would not be met with the sort of disdain that they think they will. I think they would actually be met with some opportunities to correct a lot of these problems in the profession. So the more we open up that dialogue, the more we see some of these pain points come to light, um, the more exciting I get that, you know, someday like out of architecture won't be necessary, you know, that mm -hmm. we'll actually have this sort of really fluid understanding of architecture as being both the exploration of the built environment and also all of the other things that architects are just capable of doing by the nature of our brains and the way we think and the way that we go about, you know, solving problems. So I don't know. It's a, it's a, a little bit of a sad thing when you look at, um, you know, really troubled individuals and trying to support them, but there is a very positive mm -hmm. side to the conversation coming to light. It's, it's, it, I can understand from, from like a, like a younger architect's perspective, their concern over wanting, you know, being, you know, uh, perhaps being insecure with their, with their job, their experience, they've just started working somewhere. And I also understand from the, from a, from an employer's perspective and have spoken with um, business owners where they have expressed concern of, ah, oh, we've got, we've got, you know, a young architect, they're going through, I don't know if I want to be an architect phase. Right. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, right. Okay. Get it. Because it's like, they don't know. Now they're concerned. Is this person going to be there for very long? Like, why are they doing this on our time? Are they committed to the job anymore? What it is, what is it? But there isn't, there's rarely a conversation that happens between the two. I think right. is what you're, what you're well, leading to. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> It's interesting to call it they're going through their I don't know if I want to be an architect phase. I wonder I wonder if there's some some allegories there to to other versions of of wanting to express your true self and not being supported. But um I think retention is a huge concern for all companies, not just uh not just architectural firms, mm -hmm. right? Or design firms. Um and it is a process that forces you to both look inward at your hiring processes, making sure you're finding the right people, and also your culture. Um, and a lot of those things can be misaligned for a lot of reasons, especially as companies grow, um, as needs change, as, as technologies change, so on and so forth. But it is, in fact, an introverted exercise, mm -hmm. just like creating a brand is an introverted exercise. But the only way you get feedback on it is an extroverted exercise, right? You actually have to listen to the people that are um, either in the brand metaphor are viewing you and perceiving you and how they how they kind of regurgitate that back to you. But also, I think if if our out of architecture is successful um, in getting companies and employees to have a better dialogue about what would make being maybe on the traditional path better, that is a major success. And I agree with Jake, if that means we don't get to exist anymore, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I would like to think that we could perhaps evolve as a, a network that shows showcases all the talent that the architectural education and expertise can bring. But I think if we're inspiring those conversations, that's, those are the right conversations to be happening, especially if you're just, you're trying to be a responsible business owner, right? Retaining talent investment you put in people is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, it absolutely affects your bottom line, but it also affects the work that you do. Happy employees do better work. We know this. Um, supported employees mm -hmm. want to stay. And there are plenty of firms out there that, that do this. I had the pleasure of going back or actually going to see a lecture the other day with um, Todd and Billy, who were my previous employers in conversation with Peter Zumther, who's a huge hero of mine. And I got to chat with them afterwards and, you know, working for them, being in their office was an absolute dream. And their, their retention rate is, is massive, right? They have people who work there with a tenure of over, over 10 years. So it's not like people um, don't find a home in this industry. Mm -hmm. I do think the, the idea of calling it a phase, the I don't want to be an architect anymore, is a little concerning because that either means that person is underutilized or underappreciated or both. And those are potentially fixable problems. But if someone needs to make a move, we should be encouraging that. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a mentorship-based profession, even if it's the type of work that you're doing and you need to go from, you know, big to small or small to big. I think that should be celebrated and we should talk about that more as an iterative process rather than, nope, you've landed here and we're either going to force this square peg in this round hole or we don't want you here anymore. That's, that's not sustainable in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely.
Do, what what is the conversation like in university at at current? Ryan, I, I would be interested to know um, what those conversations. You know, how, how does that transpire when you sit down with a client and they say, hey, you know, we've got this person who's in this phase, you know, are they actively engaged in how can we show this person how appreciated they are at this firm and how much we need them? Or is it a sort of hands in the air, like there's no way we can compete with, you know, UX design or there's no way we can compete with real estate, you know, development or or tech startups or whatever it so, is. So what, what's it, the, it, the flavor? It, it depends. And usually when we're talking about client um, staff retention, we're, we're having conversations with our, our clients who are business owners about creating some form of career path and career trajectory. And often at the root of these sorts of things is a lack of conversation and a lack of asking team members what is most important to you where do you want to be where do you want to go and i'll always encourage that those conversations to happen and if somebody reveals to you i want to start my own business i want to do something else great because then now your role is to support them and part of your being able to support them then is to demonstrate or to explain that how them serving and doing their role really really well is also going to be in alignment for them making the next jump in their career move. Okay, And I think most employers, I, I, you know, these people I speak to, they understand that their staff are not always not going to be there for forever. And the nature of architecture, you are going to bring on um, young, talented people who are discovering what they can do. They're discovering their, their careers. So we want to be able to make us an, an inclusive space for those people. Um, but it brings about from the, from the business person's um, perspective, it's a concern because it's like, are they going to switch out? Are they going to log off? Are they not going to be interested anymore? But normally this, this kind of conversation around, well, you know, what does career trajectory look like? What does your process look like for structuring this kind of conversation where you'll get, you are generally getting interested in your team members aspirations, desires, um, salary expectations, salary desires, financial wishes, wealth, wealth building wishes, creativity, outside interests. Okay. And then we, then that also helps to, to align. Are these two, you know, is it a fit? And if it's not a fit, that's okay. Then you can, you can depart powerfully and you can put a structure in a process that's beneficial to, to, to each. But again, it's the it's the kind of breaking down the barrier and and having a conversation, um, and we found that that's very successful, and it's also very moving, as well. And we've had many of I spoke to many business owners who have who have been very touched um, by having conversations with their team members, just simply getting interested in their world and what is it that you know this person wants to accomplish in their in their life. And I think we, we forget that, you know, from the employee standpoint, people are reserved, frightened to share that. From the employer standpoint, they're reserved, they're frightened to ask. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think it's inspiring to hear you talk about that, too. And I can almost feel the, you know, what you're talking about it being about it being moving. And I think that's that's the best part of the type of work that we do because and we talk a little bit about this in the book both from the good side and the bad side but there's an inherent intimacy to the work that we do mm -hmm. both amongst the people we do it with and also to some extent our clients depending on what you're working on and i think you know in, in some cases that's at odds with with business you have to be a professional you know all of these things but also that can be a real bonus because one of the interesting things about being a business owner and being an architect is that you have to apply your creative thinking skills to how you run your business, right? So if you can, as you're saying, sort of foster foster these conversations in order to discover new ways that people can bring value to what you're trying to do and new ways that those people can feel as though they're participating in a way that is meaningful and engaged, just those conversations are what I think foster lifetime mentor-mentee relationships, good relationships between employees, good working practices. Mm -hmm. And also it's compounding or it has a snowball effect. One of the things I often tell my, my students and Jake and I tell clients often is that you pick up a lot of the 
both bad and good habits of your first boss, right? <laughs> so when you start to think about that from the perspective of a new employee, you can take maybe a little bit of the fear out of that persona and also start to look at them, look at them as also they're human. Mm -hmm. They're good at some things. They're bad at some things. But those moments where you can maybe cut through a little bit of this uh, emotional hesitancy, I think are where you, you do start to see success. I think about at one of my early, um, early jobs, I was, I had a list on my desk of other places I was looking at uh, applying to. It was kind of in under one page in my, my notebook. And at one point I wasn't at my desk and the project manager on my project came by to drop off drawings and somehow he found it. And he wrote a little note on it that said, talk to his initials before you move to any of these firms and asterisked ones that he felt I should in particular talk to him about. And I had this moment where it was like, oh crap, I'm caught. But also, oh no, he, he wants to give me some advice that's actually incredibly valuable. And I remember sending him an email like, hey, I saw your your note, I'd be happy to, to grab coffee. And he's like, yes, whenever you're ready, let me know. And feeling like I had an ally in that was just so, it was just a moment of like <sighs> relief for me. And I, you know, I was probably maybe a fourth year at the time. And I think that that's, that's huge. And that taught me that when I see that, or if I ever saw that, either as a professor or as you know, at this point now, I guess a little bit of an employer, I can do that for someone else. So that was a good habit I felt I picked up and it's always stuck with me. Very interesting. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in the, the relationship of university as well. We spoke about this last time, um, in providing a structured path for architects to become architects and, Again, a frustration that I'll, I'll encounter from the business owner side will be that university is not providing a, you know, it's not providing fit for purpose architects. Universities will say that's not necessarily the purpose of architecture and studying architecture. And then, so then it starts to open up this, this new world of like, okay, well, if that's not the purpose of, of what it is doing. And it's providing a, a, like a new lens with which to see the world. Okay, that's very powerful. But then what do you do with it? And university doesn't have the bridges or the tools or any kind of discussion around business or entrepreneurship that will empower students to get off the architecture path before they hit business. And then they are kind of, you know, there's there's also the the, the other uh, impact or effect, if you like, that when people do step into the practice of architecture, what they've been incubated in at university is so wildly different from anything that they're experiencing in practice that it was almost, you know, you'll get this experience of students going, what the hell were we just sold? Like, you should have told me, you should have told me in the first year that we were going to be doing this because... I would have changed direction earlier and now I'm a hundred grand in and I've got to find a job and we're, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of deep set. So, so there's, there's, there's a whole load of things there and I'll leave it to you to try and unpick part well, of it to, to, to come it on. Yeah. We did just drop a whole load of shit right on the table and tell us to sort it out. Um, okay. <laughs> so I think I would start with, um, you know, this like, the the tricking the student notion okay so mm. students say like okay we get through school we call this the disconnect aaron and i it's like you get through school you you look at the profession you go oh my god this is completely different than what i was just doing for the last five seven eight years mm -hmm. why would they have done that to me there is a question there of like well if they had really told you what it was like and you were going to be think in the UK, you know, starting salary for an architect's like 23K or something, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's not like fabulous money, right? And so it's like, if they had told you that you were going to do this, and you were gonna have to go and learn a bunch of technical stuff, would you have done the course of study? I think the answer for a lot of people is, maybe, you know, maybe not, maybe I would have chosen a different avenue of design. But I would pose back to the student, well, would you have gotten as good of an education? Because I wouldn't have traded my architecture degree for anything. So maybe, you know, this uh, 
not being so explicit up front is of of great service as long as on the back end you're able to then say okay now that you have these skills here are the other pathways you actually aren't stuck with this you know we didn't try to trick you here's an option to continue forward with architecture and mm -hmm. to the employer's perspective look we can't pay you salaries that are competitive with tech because we're going to train you in real architecture so you're going to come to us for more education we can't afford to just you know shell out a ton of money because you're not really contributing that amount of value in the way that we need yeah so we're not saying that like you know oh architects have totally effed this up and this blah 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 but you have to just understand that the conversation has to be open at every intersection so when a student decides, okay, I am going to go work for a firm and the firm needs to be explicit, which often they are. And, uh, you know, I was told as a young designer, hey, you're not going to be of any use to us for the first few years, you know, and we're going to just teach you all this stuff and you have to go through and get your 3000 hours and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I think that then again, when you get uh, people in, in firms or firm leadership or owners, that complain that, oh, universities aren't teaching them how to do architecture, I would question, do you think you could really get a university to teach architecture the way you want it done? And that's a huge question is because doing architecture is not a one way practice. You know, there are not, there are some standards and best practices, but it is not a one off solution. So having the problem solving skills from this somewhat generic problem solving design driven degree are critical. So you want them to have that experience, but you also want them to have done all the technical stuff. And you also want them to accept, you know, a somewhat lower standard of living wage, and you want them to accept this, you can't have everything in one. And that is where mm -hmm. people get caught in oh, well, I'm passionate about this, so I'm screwed because I have to do it. I need to, you know, I need this satisfaction. Like I will, I, I guess I have no choice. That is caused by students leaving school with blinders on for one title and one title only of architect and not knowing that they have these choices and also with firm owners not knowing that they can have honest conversations with people coming out of school and start to differentiate, okay, what is it that you want to do within architecture? Oh, well, I really mm -hmm. like the visual or the experiential design side. And I loved planning events and doing this stuff. Maybe that's actually pertinent to your business. And you don't have to treat this young student like a generic architecture, you know, part two or whatever, you know, whatever stage they're in. I think that's also a huge issue is that we say, well, there's only one mm -hmm. degree path. You only have one degree and you only have one set of skills and one title and this and that. When in reality, you know, we all know that you can stereotype or archetype, you know, architecture students as like the person that loves model making and the person that loves rendering and the person that is the best presenter and the person that we should embrace that as a profession as well and try to encourage that you know specialization and love of passion so that we can differentiate pathways we can differentiate pay we can also help to pull people through the educational track in a way that maybe they start that specialization early maybe they have a focus you know maybe yeah. there are really clear you know multivalent threads so that when people come into architecture school we're not all competing for the same job. We're not all competing for the same firm. We're not all competing for the same title. And that would be amazing. So there you go. There's That's what I had to do with the pile of stuff you put on the table. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think also it's, I think we talk about it a lot as architects and with architectural business owners, myself included, but this is not a problem that is just alone in, to architecture or just you know exclusive to architecture. A, a doctor who graduates with a medical degree needs to go through a series of training and residency and all of these things to become someone who is allowed to, let's say, cut into a human mm -hmm. or 
do things of that nature, right? Um, when you graduate business school, it's not like you're about to be offered a CEO position with Bank of America or a massive tech company. There is a practical side of every body of, of expertise. However, spending time when you have it, so at university or in an advanced degree, where you can really get into the weeds on things, discover your personal ways in which you need to improve, discover what you're sort of naturally good at, and do that sort of <clears throat> pathfinding mm -hmm. is incredibly useful in, in school and when you're young. I also think that, and this is something my you know, 12th grade or 11th grade math teacher used to say to us, who was a welder turned math professional and then went back to being a professional welder. Um, but basically he said, you don't go to college to learn what you need to know in the real world. You go to college to prove to people you know how to learn. Mm -hmm. And that always stuck with me because no matter where you go, to Jake's point, whether it's in an architecture firm or really anywhere, you're going to have to learn new systems. You're going to have to learn new ways of communicating with different teams. If you can, I think if school, the onus is to make a designer who knows how to, who can see the world, who can put their own spin on that, who can refresh the ways that they're going to think about things, but to also put the onus on being completely up to date with all the different code and, and legal changes that exist around the world. It's impossible, right? Because you also have people who are coming to a new place and maybe going home or practicing somewhere differently. That is, in fact, impossible. However, I, I teach now or have taught now at, I think, five different institutions, three of which I teach at regularly. There are a lot of things I think that we can do in the education, on the education side that help people understand the business side of architecture much more. Um, matter of fact, I direct them to this podcast on several moments in my syllabi. Um, Thank you very much. But also all the other different ways that you can be an architect because that title is changing, mm. thankfully, right? Because our profession, our world, the way we build has changed. So I do think it's not as though this is unique to the profession of architecture, but the educational institutions are not entirely off the hook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think opening that up more and not having this antagonistic relationship is the first step. The, this antagonistic relationship between pro the profession, the working profession and academia. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it, it's interesting. I, I spoke with one of the former ROBA presidents a little while ago, and I was very excited about um, these kinds of ideas of talking about the latent potential of architectural education being applied to other disciplines and that there is, you know, there's a lot of financial benefit in that. It was something that I, you know, I, I mentioned to you last time, if I, I wished I had more access to it when I was at, at, at university, um, you know, an agency like yours, I would have been all over, um, and their their response to that was no 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 we don't we don't talk about that we don't want architects leave we don't want students leaving the profession or leaving the education system we want more of them going into architecture and one of the things that we need to be doing is that education is missing out on the core competencies of being an architect Okay, so there's a little bit of a, there's, there's kind of a different perspectives emerging. I do, I do fully appreciate both sides of the story. And there is a, there is like a lot of, you know, um, this is a very interesting kind of perception that, you know, industry is feeling like, well, actually, you know what? There is a lot of core competencies which are missing from the architects, from young architects when they come out of education. And as, as Jake was saying, the reason that they get paid so lowly is now that the, the, the businesses have to take on the the responsibility of training for extended periods of time and it's only really the larger practices that can do that properly smaller practices are really going to struggle to to be able to do that effectively and there is a big you know there's there's a lack of value if you like that they're that a young architect is perceived to be contributing that makes money and makes them money and so there's an economic argument that these core competencies, if they were, if if there was a, I don't know, a different a, a, a overhaul of architectural education, or it was shortened, or perhaps entry into the profession happened at a much earlier stage, then 
core competencies could be developed earlier. People could also be able to choose their directions at an earlier stage without having made such a such a large investment. Um, and it means that the 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 industry as a whole, and this is what another argument, is that the the fact that universities have been um, so focused on design as being what architect and design thinking as being what architecture is about has that it's meant that the lack of core competencies in the profession has meant the profession as a whole has has lost out if you like to all these other types of specialists that have emerged and have taken over what was once the remit of the of the architect so so again a, a quite a, um <laughs> i don't like that Mm -mm, I don't like that at all. So let me, let, let's have a little back and forth here. Um, yeah. What, why doesn't this problem exist in, uh, in so many other professions? It does, it does exist. Let me point to first the places that mm -hmm. it does exist, which is uh, entertainment, comedic theater, acting, publishing, you know, there's plenty of, Plenty of industries where people, you know, pay, go in and pay their dues and, and struggle through and so on. But what do you think um, other industries are doing that make their students capable of coming out and provide value immediately? It's it's to you, Ryan. Just to, just sort what of I'm I sort of leading you and down a tunnel. Okay. So what what do what do I think other industries? provide their students for them to be producing value so i don't think know that they do right so if you look at if you look at a lawyer or a doctor for example as you as you were saying mm -hmm. their you know their initial kind of you know a lawyer's a a, a, a a very young lawyer when they go into their practices get paid not a lot however however with those sorts of professions there is like an enormous uplift that does happen Mm -hmm. which doesn't happen which doesn't happen in architecture or is a lot harder to, ac right. to accomplish right and i'm going to just jump in not to derail your your tunnel jake but i think and look it is if you're a business owner you have to you have to tend to your bottom line you have to be sustainable about who you hire and how and how much they cost you and it's difficult sometimes to talk about those resources because they're humans mm -hmm. but there's a reality to that now that said, a responsible business owner also needs to understand that as a fact of their doing business mm -hmm. and realize collectively also as a profession that the value that we advocate for as architects is not enough. And, the, and I can only speak intelligently about this in the United States because <clears throat> this is what I've studied and this is how I frame it in my pro prac course. But this you've been sort of it's been a race to the bottom since the 1970s. Right, and, and there's been legislation and also um, codes codes of conduct and ethics put down by the AIA that I vehemently disagree with that do seriously affect this. There's also economic changes, right? We've had a series of recessions. We've talked about these other um, other disciplines or, or experts, other um, sectors of experts coming up and, and chewing away or eating away at that pie. But as someone who was just recently on on our our new podcast put it put it. It is the job of the architect to work with, manage, and sort of wrangle all of this expertise that they don't actually understand, but can know enough to bring everyone to the table. And that is a massive expertise in and of itself, and it has a massive amount of value. For some reason, we are unable to convey that to the world at large and command that value. Mm. Whereas a lawyer does that as well, correct? For understanding all of the law and bringing all the parties together and being able to negotiate and back dealing, but also perform in the courtroom. A person who sees, you know, law and order or the good wife or whatever sort of shows or whatever that they see a lawyer doing that starts to understand that value, right? We don't have that as architects and we don't do a very bad job, I think or the people who've come before us as well, have done a very bad job of conveying that value and commanding fees that match it. Mm -hmm. You know, the architecture, the con construction, excuse me, the construction industry is just a large pool of money that moves around. We have lost out more and more of that pie to specialists and to only do the work that we want to accept liability for. And that just gets smaller and smaller, which means you're pressured from the top and you can't pay all the way through. And that, 
that is a systemic issue. If everyone is saying that, that that means that there's a problem way up at the top, not just at the bottom. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so uh, I'll walk was... back, back the other way through the tunnel real quick okay. before we keep going and say, <laughs> so um, I do think that what you both said is, is very accurate. So let's turn around and look at the, you know, the individual, both of you are saying that the business is in some ways to blame for not commanding the value and turning that and, and disseminating it to the people who are, who are doing the work, who are performing, who are actually doing something meaningful when they come out of school or learning to do something meaningful. Um, but we were at this kind of crux of, you know, you were speaking to this former pre, um, Reba president. We, we had touched on this point of like, well, we need to teach them more, more about what architects do. And I just have this immense, um, immense problem with understanding that, an architect has to do everything. And we talk about, you know, the ego of the architect, or we look at, uh, in the book, there's a, an entire narrative passage about this painting that Michelangelo is pointing to this beautiful model of St. Peter's Cathedral in front of Pope Paul IV. And, you know, it's it's picturing him as the sole practitioner, right? This, in the gentleman's profession. And mm-hmm. it's a complete fallacy you know, that we've sort of drawn up. And I think what happens is we go into school, we think that everything is on us, you know, we're not really learning, we're, we're learning to produce our own ideas, we're not learning how to collaborate, we're not learning how to also showcase value. And then when we get out of school, you're immediately told, well, your ideas that you've been cultivating aren't valuable you know, and you don't have the technical Mm. skills to back them up. So start over. What (laughs) I think we should do is we should, instead of forcing everyone to, you know, learn more, thereby being again, this like one person who has to do everything and still doesn't know enough, we should stop putting that idea of, uh, you know, like forcing people into this insecurity And instead saying, look, whatever pathway, whatever portion of this that you have a natural inclination towards, have a natural competency in, we're going to use that. That is a valuable part of what we do just because you don't know also how to, you know, very detailed build Revit families is not necessarily the end of the world. You know, we're not going to say, well, you're not valuable because you're coming out without this one part or without the part that we need at the moment. Instead, firms should be hiring for that skill instead of looking at someone's design portfolio, hiring them based on like the beautiful work and their conceptualization and then saying, sorry, we hired you for your, you know, portfolio, but really we need you to be better at this other thing. I would Mm -hmm. never do that in my professional life at Adidas. I have never had a job where I went and hired someone because I thought that their conceptual design work was so good that I actually didn't care at all about the tools that they used. That's it. That's absurd. Yeah. Likewise, no, no, you know, those no, tools this, don't just have to be softwares, right? Yeah. Well, this is very interesting because this, this starts to, and, and, um, Aaron was kind of, uh, pointing at this earlier about the hiring processes that many architecture businesses use. They're terrible. And they don't necessarily even know what it is that their business needs right now. So it is a kind of, and particularly the, with the last few years of the, of the, the difficulty that has been existing around hiring, that there has been a kind of just, you, you've got an architecture degree and, you know, you're kind of half competent, just come in, come in. And that's caused that's caused a lot that's caused a lot of problems. And there's a lot of there is a lot of mismatch. There is absolutely a lot of a lot of mismatch. And this is where yeah, where the businesses are responsible for, you know, up in their game in making sure that you're attracting and bringing the right people on in the in the first place. Um, and the the lack of the perceived lack of kind of oh, we we need ready made architects. Well, I think that's another that's a that kind of comes into what the RBA president was talking about. And building out of architecture, we, you know, 
we have hired lots of ex architects. You know, our team mm -hmm. since we've spoken, Ryan has gone from I don't know three to nine or something along those lines, and no person in that is intended to do everything. We have people who are focused on marketing and digital strategy. We have someone who's focused on social media content creation and community management. We have someone whose sole job is producing and hosting a podcast. We have advisors, and even those advisors are specialized in specific areas, maybe helping students more, maybe focusing more on those who are looking to kind of make a change within architecture for those who are looking to make a transition to you know, a, an area that maybe is more commercially focused or more startup focused. None of those people are intended to do it all. And we mm -hmm. made that decision very consciously because it's a sort of nonsensical thing to say, you know, we could hire an administrator, but instead let's go hire a professional and then pay them to do administrative work. It's, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. And we do that kind of with our young architects, right? We go, we mm -hmm. say, look, you've got these great digital skills, you know, you could be using in, you know, visual, uh, you know, FX, you could be going into the gaming industry, you could be creating models, whatever it is, we're going to hire you. And then we're going to teach you how to do administrative work because you haven't learned how to do that. What the f Ryan, why would we do that? That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yep. Yep. Now with this, and again, this, this, this happens right across the board with architecture firms hiring the wrong people for the wrong places. Um, and being very broad in their expectations, which also confuse causes confusion for the team members and for the people that end up becoming employees in those kinds of in those kinds of businesses. And again, you know, the, the and, you know, this is a whole other world of talking about recruitment and hiring, and but it's but it's you know it's another really it's another really really important part of this complex organism um that 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 people are investing into and kind of you know there is um, the, the reason why we're all having this conversation is because there is so much there's a lot of pain in architecture right now mm -hmm. there's a lot of pain and, then, Absolutely. and there's a lot of potential and we're, and i think we're all we're all united here because that's that's like it upsets us and it's and it's kind of we want right well yeah it's the bottleneck too it's what's keeping that from actually getting better because at the end of the day, you don't want good architects who can do great work to have to shut out their offices because they can't find talent or they can't sustain talent or they can't keep talent, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, recruitment and recruiters tend to be a little bit ostracized as well. And I, I think in our profession, and I can understand why, because there are a lot of instances where recruiters really kind of come out of nowhere and don't really know the person and their experience all that well to know where they're looking to place them. But we had a great conversation with someone who's now transitioned from being an architect to being an architectural recruiter. And he made a really interesting point, which is like, you know, I don't want to put someone in a role that they're going to hate and want to leave because it affects, you know, their bottom line, right? So there's actually a whole business and a whole actual science around recruiting and fitment and what are the needs and who can actually provide those needs and is this job description correct is this actually two roles right and i think that level of, of really business design mm -hmm. is very hard at the smaller level and the mid-sized firm and really from a population perspective at least in the u.s you have the mega firms and then you have a dwindling middle class mm -hmm. of like you know 20 to 40 or 45 and then most of it is is smaller firms who are really below that 20 20 person threshold and the person running that wears a million hats, right? So the ability to do what Jake was talking about, this idea of like, we have someone who handles this and that it's, it, it can be a luxury that not everyone has. One would say you need to argue, you need to look at why that's the case. However, it's very rampant in the architecture industry that it's who, you know, again, also not, you know, unique to us. But back to Jake's point about the process of hiring, it's all right, your portfolio is going to show me how you think. And then there's a rapport check, mm -hmm. which is, I think, something that's important in every job interview. But this idea of like, in the long term, how can I use this person? It's incredibly hard to understand that because architects are beholden to these economic cycles where you don't know next year, always, especially at that size, what's going to be in your pipeline. So 
a lot of this process does need to be incredibly intuitive, but that does not mean we can actually lean on systems that are already in place that we know work to help feed into that process, right? You have a lot of architects that hire students that they've either taught or come on a recommendation because there's that added layer of, okay, I know how you think, I know how you work, I've seen you on your bad days as well as your good days, and I think I can use you. But I do think opening up our profession to other disciplines, other areas of expertise, which firms do quietly. You know, Paul Nakazawa sits on the board of Shop and Studio Gang and all these places, at least he did at one point, or consulted for these people. And that's not, their success is not an accident, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> there are businesses that are built to support the success of businesses. And I think, you know, this this view of, of you know, Ayn Rand and, and kind of holding the world on our shoulders, just give it up. You can't do it. We're failing at it. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, it's it's holding everyone else down. And it's a part of this bottleneck mm -hmm. that I think is really getting in the way. And I agree, you know, we're all vehemently talking about this or excitedly talking about this because we, I want it to change. I want the profession to be better. Um, the interesting thing about out of architecture for us, I think, is that uh, I went into it at least with the notion of, okay, I can't change architecture from the top down because I am not at the top, nor do I think I have the, the sort of stamina or the will to, to do all the things I would need to do to get there. But now we're getting to have conversations and people are listening who are at the top. We always thought it would be a sort of bottom bottom up exercise, but the reality is it has to be both. Yeah. Absolutely. So how was the, the, the book? Tell us a little bit more about the, about the book, how you guys kind of brought this together, its intention, and it's already been released, right? It was released a couple of, I saw it was number one in architecture books on yeah, Amazon. Yes, so we are, it, it is at the moment in, the, in new releases and we're um, looking forward to, uh, probably by the time this podcast is out, uh, November 10th is the release date, and we will very likely um, be, you know, sitting on stacks and stacks of uh, pennies because we'll be so wealthy. We'll have at least dollars <laughs> uh, from all the books we've sold. Um, no, but uh, in in honesty, you know, it was um, the book was really meant to be uh, a place where we could have this conversation, this kind of intimate moment with the reader, um, but you know, without necessarily forcing them into the place of having to come and, and sit with us. I mean, you know, another thing that became really apparent early in the business is that, uh, you know, Aaron and I's time is not scalable, you know, and, mm. and the conversations and, you know, the reason why we love sitting with you on this podcast is because you have cultivated an incredible audience of people who care and want to share these, these stories. And so we're happy to come and sit here and, and to espouse, you know, the way that we think and, uh, you know, the way that we feel, but it's mm -hmm. a it's a really nice uh, you know collection of a lot of those thoughts, um, and it's was you know a three year long project. Wow. Started um, you know as a kind of how can we elaborate some of the the skills, the tips, the the experiences into into one collection of words, and it ended up resolving in a kind of a three part structure and really it's it's called out of architecture the value of architects beyond traditional practice and at its core it really is a discussion on value so it is very much this conversation that we've been having of why do we you know see ourselves as having this kind of lens of value you know what is the way that we build that vision of the world what is the way that we sort of come into conflict with it you know as we enter into the profession mm -hmm. and then finally how do we resolve that and how do we make change and so those three parts are really falling in love with the the design of architecture the skills the profession it shares a lot of experiences that Aaron myself my wife Rachel who's also a recovering architect you know there's there's numerous <laughs> stories in there from clients and uh, and people who who are critical in building out of architecture. But then in that middle section, we address some of these things that we've also spoken about. So we address the disconnect. We talk about the gentleman's profession. we talk about insecurity and the notion of the insecure overachiever, right? That we have to carry mm -hmm. all of this on our shoulders. Um, and we mm -hmm. provide examples from our professional lives, from, from those of clients, from different experiences. And we start to highlight in that section how you can sort of see the narrative unraveling a little bit. Right. And, and where those threads pull apart. And part of that is just so that we can tell other people 
that they're not alone. Because I think that these conversations, as much as they're starting to come to the forefront, um, they really mm -hmm. are still very difficult to have in the professional context. That last section of the book is case studies. It's clients that we've had um, that are sort of a conglomeration. So it's no one person, but they're an amalgamation of the sort of types of clients over the last 750 that we've had at this point throughout of architecture. And it tells some of their stories and the ways in which they found themselves either grappling with this notion of leaving, um, you know, the conversations that we had with them in each of those chapters in the last section, we also highlight um, kind of a core fundamental idea, either, you know, this kind of hidden job network or the notion that, you know, maybe you don't know what you don't know. And taking that attitude of just being a fantastic learner is at the core of seeking whatever your next challenge is. So mm -hmm. um, it was it was a, an absolute um, pleasure of a project to work on. But Thank God it's over. It's fantastic. We can't wait to see it out in the world. But, um, you know, bless anyone who has been through the publishing process because it is it is brutal. But I, I was Jake is also lamenting the fact that he had to read it probably about another three or four times out loud to record our audio book. Oh, so right. part of this is, is vocal. <laughs> yeah, part of this is vocal fatigue as well. But also why he can rattle those off so so well. <laughs> Amazing, amazing. Everyone was giving me a little bit of a glimpse of, um, you know, how you guys actually structured the book through audio conversations, transcriptions of, and then kind of started to go through the, the rigor, if you like, of actually taking those transcriptions and turning them into, into real sentences. And when you realize that we speak very broken, fragmented, um, ways i look forward to i look forward to um delving into that with a, with a lot more more depth we're coming to the the end here of the conversation um and as always i've thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you so you guys have got a new podcast out called tangents what is that about yeah, so that um, it's brand new. It released actually yesterday for us. So uh, November first was our first episode drop, and I think you know the two endeavors of the book and the podcast were really to address that point earlier from Jake about you know our time is finite, um, but also it came from this perspective of while the book will be a piece of evergreen content, you know it doesn't change. It is it's there and it's static, and, and we're very proud, and and we think a lot of the points are are, are relevant and salient. The podcast is really this way to to get a lens into all of the stories and all of the paths and all of the the struggles and triumphs and tribulations um, that we get to hear when speaking with clients and be a part of in helping them on their journey that other people don't get to hear. And I think one of the things that Jake and I have had so many conversations about over this you know, really past five years of the endeavor of Out of Architecture has been how humbling it is to be a part to be able to listen to those stories and then to help in in some small or even some some large ways sometimes, but it's all confidential, right? It's it's all something that um, we take very very seriously the privacy of our clients. But at the same time, going back to how we opened this episode, people being able to hear those stories, know that there are successes and failures, and know that there are so many other ways to have agency, I think is in incredibly important. One of the things that we we try to do within the podcast, which is hosted by Sylvia Lee, who's who's just absolutely wonderful. Like, listening to her is like literally just getting an audio hug. Um, but one of the things she asks all of our our um, you know our our visitors on the podcast is, you know, describe yourself in three words, and you get all of these adjectives that so many people who share you know the title architect and who share you know, to some degree, the same expertise, all the different ways that they view their value in the world. Um, we also ask them, you know, how do they define what it what it is to be an architect, which again, var variety of definitions. And I think if we can put that out there and showcase that in, in its best light, maybe there'll be, you know, more conversations to be had around all the ways that we can we can transform, expand, or even in some cases, leave the profession, but leave it in a, in a, a better way than than we perhaps found it fantastic i think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation i know jake has got another meeting to go to we've kept we've kept you here thank you guys so much that was a meeting with a pint that's that's the meeting 
perfect. Those are the best. Those are the best meetings. So thank you guys so much for today's enlightening uh, conversation. As I said before, I yeah, absolutely love what you guys are doing. I think it's, you know, you're one of the missing pieces in this whole complex ecosystem of the gestation of an architect and actually, you know, you know what you're doing, unlocking the latent potential of the architect and actually helping people live what an architect can be rather than just speculate about it i think is you know it's brilliant it's absolutely amazing so thank you once again you're always welcome on business of architecture as guests and i hope that this is you know one of a series of further conversations that we continue to have likewise thank you so much ryan it's it's great to come back and, and chat thanks ryan it was a pleasure to come back for round two and we're looking for for many more so awesome And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.